Thanks for staying with us. It's time to go to the press. Let's see what made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies. Our guest this morning is our usual, uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, who is a legal practitioner. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Thanks for having me. I'm doing fine, very fine. <laughs> well, uh, I didn't have a chance to wish you happy independence yesterday, so happy independence. It's just a day after today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Yeah. We hope that uh, from now, things will turn around for the country as a whole. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, let's uh, start with Business NG. Um, we're not starting with uh, the major headline. We're starting with a small headline there at the top left corner, which says, Tinubu's economic revival plan meets resistance as protesters demand change. Yesterday, people were celebrating, but some others were uh, protesting. And we heard what the president was saying about his economic recovery plan and uh, his policies that he intends to do, including the confab for youths. I uh, would like to have your comments. I want to say that um, the speech that the president delivered yesterday is about um, uh, one of the best that he has ever delivered since he came to power. The speech is, in the way I can say, is a conciliatory and it tends to give the Nigerian people the measure of hope that things will turn around to be better, things will turn around to be better in the nearest uh, future. Uh, furthermore, it will be that uh, the government has recognized that the youth have a great role to play in making things uh, happen in Nigeria. And we say it's going to be convoking a youth conference where the public, the policies of government to be explained to them, and then you will find a way to really carry the youth uh, along. Part of the problem we have had in this country is that people in government always behave and act that they know it all. They never want to carry the different segments of society along with them. And you know the youth is a very critical sector of the, uh, of the population. We describe them as the leaders of tomorrow. Whatever policies you are going to implement, whatever program that you have for the people, you ought to educate and also carry this very critical sector around. But I suspect that the conference that the government is going to be organizing will be meant to educate the youth on the policies of government, the challenges that the nation is facing, and also what is happening around the world. So I think I welcome that initiative. It's a very welcome development. Let us hope that it is not going to be politicized, that it is not the, the tilt wing of their political parties that they are going to invite, but rather youth who have uh, contributions to make, youth who could understand what the government is doing, youth who could make suggestions to the government as regards uh, how things should be done. Because too many times we have seen a situation in which the older people, the elderly people, have this fixation. They think that they know it all and that the youth have nothing as significant to contribute. But we are in the Z age, the Z age, as we people, the Z age, as we people will call it. Too many things are happening around us in a very, very rapid manner that we, the older people, are unable to grapple with. And this youth, they are so versatile, they are so educated, they are so exposed. Technology has given me a cutting edge over the young people. That we need to pick their brains and then speak their advice or know what they are thinking. So as to be able to formulate them into whatever policies and programs that the government intends to implement. Well, uh, like you said, it's hope. And everything about this uh, government is hope. Because... Um, uh, the youths were the ones who, who, who did the, the uh, uh, NSAS. The youths were also the ones who did end bad governments. The youths are also the ones who did uh, fearless in October. Uh, but the president had to wait till after August. No pronouncement was made till 1st of October. 
And the next major time that the government, the, the president is likely to talk is maybe the 1st of uh, January. Uh, he did not give us a timeline for when this confab will happen. He did not give us the criteria of choosing the youths that will be part of this conference and all that. That is in the pipeline, which means it might take another three years for that confab to happen. So we do not know that. That gives me worry as a person. And uh, we do hope that it will be on time. But we are also thinking that it's a possibility he will send out his people, go mobilize the people that will come and form that confab. And you know that a 30-day confab organized by the federal government will involve some, you know, stipends and all that to the people who will be there. So there will be a lot of interest in who goes and who does not go. And that gives me worry as well. So I don't know whether the outcome of this conference will be truly the position of Nigerians and Nigerian youths especially. Because for all the youths I know that are loyal to this government, they speak the same language with the government. So what are they going to discuss there if they eventually become the ones that are chosen, handpicked by the loyalists to the APC government? I don't know. That's what gives me worry. But um, like you said... I, uh, I quite agree yeah. with you. Yeah. I quite agree with you. Also remember that times without number, we have organized conferences in this country which at the end of the day, whatever recommendations they go, they, they, the conferences made and all that, just find their way into the archive. Take for example, the Dr. Gulon Jonathan. He spent uh, millions of naira to organize that political conference. What has become of that political conference up to now? That's Yes, that, that's my that's my fear. Uh, to be to be fair to the gov uh, the Jonathan administration, he said the conference was organized at the time that the implementation should have been uh, done by the next government uh, because he couldn't have implemented those things. It was done too late. That's why I'm worried that uh, we should have had a timeline now so that if that conference is held in the early days of this administration, he can begin to implement whatever the provisions of those, uh, that conference is before he leaves office after four years. But if he's having it in mind, just like Jonathan had it in mind that he was going to have eight years in government, uh, and then he organizes this conference when he is two or three years into his government, thinking that he will use the implementation of this conference report as a, a bargaining chip for, for campaigns, then we might have a problem again because we never know what will happen in 2027. No matter how confident a person can be, we would never know. Uh, look at what happened in Edo. A sitting governor has been removed and his party is nowhere to be found, more or less. So anything can happen in 2027. We don't know how it's going to be. So I'm worried that he's not giving us timelines. And even if he gives us timelines, it should be early enough in his administration so that we can use that as part of the template to implement a lot of things that will make Nigerians smile, at least. That's my worry. Yes, your, your, your worries are quite clear. Uh are quite understandable. But what I would just want to add is that, uh, look, ordinary the government is supposed to be a continuum. Yes, but well, it's not in Nigeria. Uh, mm. Organize a political concert, and there are good things in the report that were turned out. It may be the, the government has fulfilled Dr. Kula Jonathan up to have uh, taken off, up to have continued yes. where he left off. Exactly. But too many times we want to reverse the wheel. We think that whatever our presidents do are not good. I want to start all over again uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it's best known to the people uh, in power. It ought not to be like that. Too many times with the political will are not there. Say, for example, Dr. Gulo Jonathan, the political power. A lot of recommendations in there were good, but some of those recommendations were not welcomed by a section of the country mm -hmm. or different sections of different sections of the country. And because it doesn't go to the palatable to them, they find a way to make sure that that uh, copper, the report of that copper, quite reason get off the book, uh, off to the archive, or get out of the archive. Also, even look at the Rosary report, look at the Buddha panel report and what happened. How many of them have been implemented today? It's sad, we it's have sad, a really. Of, uh, just uh, when our house is burning, we quickly convoke a uh, compound, start to start the fire. And as soon as the fire is quenched and all that, it becomes to your test is that we go back to where, 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 where we used to do. We forget about where the rain started to beat us and what happened. Well, he said, you know, who composed this uh, compound and all that. The youth who have been very, very 
alert who have been asking, asking questions since the answer uh, uprising of yes and no. I am sure they will not let him be. And if he also tries to make the comfort the political thing, i.e. a forum for, for, for the youth wing of their political parties to 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 do and and, and, and uh, or whatever uh, that would mean. I am sure this uh, radical youth who has been pushing for a better Nigeria will not allow him to be. So uh, for us to get anything positive out of the comfort, whenever it is convoked and any presentations and all that, we will not allow the youth to be on the neck, to be on their toes, to also insist that whatever recommendations they make and which is the government that invited them to come and make it, she also be it's about getting forcing the political will to develop the right political will to get yeah. to the uh, um. men. I mean, uh, for the uh, implementation of that, um, uh, the, uh, the comfort uh, report, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, whatever, uh, whatever people attended the comfort, they could also insist uh, on uh, giving the government a guideline because the kind of people and the kind of person they want to see at that comfort. Of course, uh, the entire uh, Nigeria people, too, the elders, you, the journalists, or people in the media, the clergymen, like the Catholic uh, Church. Which has been very vocal and been saying the right things. I have always said the right time, the right time, without minding who's us with God. They can also be instrumental in making sure that we have a very useful compact that will contribute to the well being of Nigeria, that will move the Nigerian forward, and that will without the restlessness that we have been seeing with the Nigerian people in recent yeah. time. Okay, uh, well, we, we've seen all that. Um... I don't know. I, I'm, I just feel that this, the major headline on the business NG, uh, we shouldn't even talk about it. But as briefly as possible, please, Port Harcourt Refinery to commence operations soon. Uh, that is according to oil marketers. There's no specific date that has been given. If it's worth talking about, please go ahead, Mr. Kolawole. What do you think? Well, this is uh, what we have been hearing over a long, long period of time. Remember that uh, even a uh, few years uh, or a few months before uh, President Buhari was in office, he awarded the Jubo contract for the rehabilitation of this refinery. And that period in time, people were asking questions. We have a few years left to do this. How will you make sure that this project is completed before you leave? And he said it should just be given a few months. That few months have turned to years. And then this government also came in under Kiari, and they've been telling us if you start working in June, if you start working in June, if you start working in September, if you start working. We are now in October, and that refinery is not working. And I even remember the women wing of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, they threw a challenge to the government and said, look, we are women engineers. Give us the responsibility to fix these refineries and all that. And we will deliver the refinery within uh, six months. And all that. But lo and behold, the government didn't take up uh, that uh, challenge. Well, it is difficult for any Nigerian now to believe in whatever government says with regard to any of these uh, refineries because the trust is no longer there. There is a unique gap between what the government says and what the Nigerian people have seen them do with regard to the rehabilitation of these refineries. A very, very huge uh, trust is a deficit. But then, let us just keep our fingers crossed. Let's give the government the benefit of doubt that um, they will match their word with action. But if their precedent is anything to go by, if what has happened in respect of this refinery still remains what it used to be, it is that truth that this refinery will work in the nearest or in the short while. Uh, like I said, policymakers of the government only say, you don't begin to tell people that it cannot be done. If you tell people that this and that cannot be done, then they will do so. And the responsibility of government to continue to give the people law. So I suspect that this is part of the reason they say some of these things that they know is not realizable, that they know it's not working, that they know it's not going to work within the time span that they have given us. They are giving us hope so that we will not be despondent, so that we will not lose hope, so that uh, we will not begin to, to get restless as regards uh, whatever they say will happen in this refinery. But thank God, the assurances you are getting from the transport refinery is that uh, even if all these uh, government refineries don't work, 
refineries capacity to really provide the energy in all the particular products that the entire Nigeria has, in, even the whole of West Africa, according to them. The challenge that refinery is facing today is that um, it will appear they are not allowed that to refinery to, to work the way it should work. And why the government is not allowed that to refinery? So begin to sell, for example, to all the marketers directly is what we don't uh, I don't understand. And also, too, uh, Dan Gotha, too, has been speaking from both sides of the map. So they will say you can supply enough energy made for us in, in the of petroleum products. Again, you will say that they didn't believe that they are shooting the subsidy. The pressure we got is that if we begin to produce this locally using our own materials, with, uh, by cutting off the cost of importing the raw materials, by cutting off a substantial chunk of cost of transportation and all that, then whatever is produced uh, from that water should be a little bit cheaper than whatever is imported from abroad. So we should begin to get it cheaper. But that is not the message we are getting from the Grand Water Refinery. The appeal again will also be that the government and Dangote and whoever is producing fuel in the country today should please sit down and take the interest of the average Nigerian people into consideration and align us to enjoy the benefits of our God given gift. Nigeria is not the only country in the world where one thing or the other is subsidized. Uh, okay. uh, Saudi Arabia, in Germany, in France, and other America, I'm aware. Cost of transportation, agriculture, and what have you, they are all subsidized. Education, too, in the wind, subsidized in some of these places and all that. So, if oil is the only thing that we have to subsidize and all that, I don't see anything wrong with it. Even look at what Angote came up with uh, very recently, which was uh, fighting to me as a person. He said that the fuel is uh, more expensive in Saudi Arabia. We produce more um, uh, more petroleum products than we do. And because of that, we should regulate. The government in Nigeria should stop their subsidizing. But Mr. Angote didn't tell us that uh, the cost of living in Saudi Arabia and wages, what people are paid, is not the same thing as Nigeria. You also have all sorts of financial, all sorts of uh, housing subsidized in Saudi Arabia, transportation is subsidized, education is subsidized. You could have so many things on your fingertips without laboring too much for it and all that. So comparing Saudi Arabia to what is happening in Nigeria, in you know, opinion, uh, isn't uh, uh, appropriate. And asking government to regulate uh, the rest sector totally. Uh, also, for me, it's uh, very strange. How many times are we going to deliver? How many times are we going to remove something? We have been hearing about this subsidy removal since time immemorial, since our passengers era. So, haven't they completed the removal of the subsidy up to now? Or oh, are they adding subsidies to any time they say they have, they have removed one? So, let the government sort themselves out with the Gangotha people and let us begin to enjoy the benefits of what God has given us as a nation. Yeah, uh, I think so too. Okay, uh, let's take a few other ones. Um, uh, well, that that, Dan, uh, that refinery has missed the seventh production rollout deadline anyway, uh, just to say that. Uh, flooding, the Punch newspaper, flooding worsens despite 180 billion naira spent on dams. That's on the Punch, small headline there. Yes, uh the, well, well, uh, there's been a lot of controversy uh, with regards to that uh, dam. For example, I read somewhere before this uh, point uh, report that uh, the governor of, um, of the Borono State was alerted as regards to certain structural weaknesses with regards to that uh, uh, dam that uh, busted in, uh, in the Borono State. Mm. We were also told that certain monies like this YC video, whatever, was made available. And rather than use that money to rehabilitate the dam, they simply waved it up and diverted the money uh, to something else or to somewhere else. Well, I, we have not, uh, I mean, we haven't been able to ascertain the veracity of that egregious uh, claim. What we know is that uh, the Bonnet government, governor has been a man of honor, has been a man of integrity. He has been accountable since um, he became uh, the governor. But if this is true, well, the ESCC and some of these other bodies will require 
and to investigate what really happened and now see whether this which amount of money was actually made available for the rehabilitation of that um, uh, dam and uh, that it was uh, not done. If that is the case and know that that becomes a very serious uh, misconduct, in fact, you could say that uh, it borders on uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, the willful destruction of, uh, of the property, and then the manslaughter of uh, the citizens of Orono State. Because you should remember that they saw a lot of people died uh, when that dam um, uh, busted uh, and then overflow, uh, taking swimming and drowning people, and then destroying uh, which sorts of people. Uh, the property and the livelihood. Well, that border to the realm of crime. The police and then the ESPC and some of these other government agencies in charge of enforcement of law will require to go in there, investigate what happened, and whoever has been negligent or culpable with regard to that rehabilitation of that term should just be brought to book according to the law. But I wouldn't want to start speculating. Too many things get into the media today without people who have been a thorough investigation as regards to what happened. So I should suggest that we should keep our fingers crossed with regards to this allegation that is being made. The monies are made available to rehabilitate the refine, I mean to rehabilitate the staff, but that money was diverted to somewhere. I still will not believe that the Governor Sulam that we have been hearing so much about in the last six or some years or whatever will do a thing like that. Okay. Um, uh, let's just take this finally. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's funny or it's not funny, but uh, the, a small headline, uh, bottom left corner on the Punch newspaper says, federal government extends rice subsidy program to states. Rice subsidy program. Federal government uh, extends rice, extends, uh, rice subsidy, subsidy program. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, uh, in fairness to this government, they have been subsidizing subsidy and rice production <laughs> for a very long, long time. <laughs> I remember as far back as the uh, trailer uh, of Alaji Shem Shagarim uh, time, that is between 1979 and 1983, mm. and then even from the era of the Russian government to jump as the military head of state, this government has been trying all manners of effort to ensure or to encourage local, local production of uh, like remember it was part of that that the series research institute was set up at the uh, Bateki. You also have the right uh, research institute uh, in the pattern. And I was aware at the time government was also helping the farmers to cultivate or to build the land and uh, they allocate this uh, portion of land to farmers. To be able to plant a uh, uh, rice. I also remember that uh, the government has encouraged even people like Dangote, uh, Nestle Food, and so many of these other um, uh, food production companies and all that to embark on rice uh, production. But for one reason or the other, we are finding it still difficult to produce rice at the scale in which we should be producing it. Also, remember that the Lagos State government has invested a lot of money. The rice production. So also the Ogun State government, so also the Niger State government, so also the Kuala State government, and all that. It would appear to me that um, it's a matter of attitude now. The average Nigerian farmer seems not to be encouraged uh, to produce uh, uh, rice uh, locally. And the reason for this is not perfect. They find it difficult to compete with rice that is being imported from uh, Ukraine, from uh, China. From uh, uh, is this Indonesia, from Thailand, and some of these places. And they say we protect the local farmer from the onslaught of what is being imported from abroad and what has been. The possibility is that, that whatever efforts we make in that direction is never going to yield results. Because you also remember that when you compare the quality of the rice that is produced in Nigeria with what is imported, uh, the difference is uh, too much. Too many times our own local police side is blazing with a stone and all forms of particles uh, that uh, may be injurious to the teeth and to the health of whoever consumes at the end of the day. So we need to uh, invest in machinery 
for processing of rice, we also will have to raise a brigade, a kind of farming brigade, who will be doing outreach program um, to the farmers who produce the rice in the different part of the country and other. And of course, too, we could also raise a brigade amongst our children who go to study agriculture in the universities, in the polytechnic, in the colleges for education. Give them incentives to really begin to produce uh, rice. I don't know whether you have visited the places where rice is produced before. It's usually a massive land full of water. It is not a place where uh, ordinary persons <laughs> who want to be seen around. I, I come from I, I come from a community are all over the place to bite you and leave a mask on your body. So if one is going to be working in that environment, he will require from serious incentive. He will also require to be making some good profit. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Kolawole, um, uh, we're wrapping up. Also not forget, which is the reality. All over the world today, farming is not a popular thing. Nobody wants to engage in the drug way of farming. They want to ask yourself, how many millions, how many billions can you make from farming? Like mm. uh, Mike Zuckerberg, like Elon Musk. The children are turning into IT and telecommunications and some of these uh, okay. other issues. Or some of these other vocations that bring a very good money, music that bring very good money to start a too much exertion. Thank you, Mr. Kolawole. Yeah. Mm. Go with the family. So yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kolawole. Um, uh, eventually, we just lost his audio at the, at, the, at the end. This is where we should have wrapped up, but uh, we'd like to thank you. Uh, in case you can hear us, we can't hear you anymore. Uh, but just as, a, just as a small comment, uh, rice is not always in a swampy area. There's, there's uh, upland rice, there is uh, swamp uh, rice and all that you can plant it. I come from a community that plants rice and I know for a fact that if we had, let's say, two tractors that can plow the land in that community, they can feed um, the entire state or two or three states uh, more. Uh, if that is done, just because they have uh, the tractors. And then if you have irrigation um, facilities, then they can farm all year round, maybe at least two times or three times, because there are varieties of rice that, cost, uh, that go for three months only. Some are for two months, and they are ripe for harvest. Then the small things that they need are treasures. They need small things like uh, fertilizers. They need small things like um, uh, rice meals that are very small, but uh, they also cannot uh, pick the stones out. But they have other machines that they call distoners that uh, the government could provide for these small-scale farmers so that you produce your rice, you, you, you process it yourself, you distone it, remove all the stones and all that. At the end of the day, it's only the stones that mark out the local rice as it is. Once you have the facility to remove all the stones, then it becomes the same thing. I, in fact, I had one of the biggest rice mills in Africa in my village at one point in, in the 80s and the early 90s. So I know what I'm talking about. Nigerian rice and foreign rice, there's no difference except that we are sure our own is not plastic rice because I hear sometimes people produce plastic rice from factories and all that and we're eating unhealthy rice and calling it foreign. Anyway, that story for another day. Like we said, thank you, Mr. Kolawole, for coming on the show. We'll take a short break, and we are going to be joined. We are already joined by our guest, but we'll give him a breather and then return to him to talk on our first hot topic. Stay with us.